is here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Mark Levin here, our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. As you know, during the course of this half hour or hour, Ron DeSantis will be announcing for President of the United States. Um, much anticipated, frankly. And he will be on this program at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time in our third hour. Uh, he will be doing uh, his announcement on Twitter with Elon Musk. He will be on Fox at 8 p.m. Eastern, and then he will be on this program at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, and that's it for the day. So we will be the first and the exclusive radio show on which he appears, and I hope you'll join us in the last hour. We have another guest in the second hour. Uh, who I want to talk to about this debt ceiling stuff. And that is Byron Donalds, who is our old friend, and he will be here at 7.20, scheduled anyway, p.m. Uh, in hour two. So we look forward to that as well. And meanwhile, I have a lot to do here. I am sick and damn tired of the Democrats and the media and these fraudulent, phony academicians telling us that the Constitution allows the Democrats to destroy our economy when it gives them no such right. Now I will ask you, because you've been listening to this program, many of you for years, some of you for months, but most of you for years. Do you think the framers of the Constitution, even more, do you think those who adopted the 14th Amendment, both supermajorities of the House and the Senate and the state legislatures, would have agreed to give a president the power to not only submit a budget, but to fund the budget? If Congress didn't get along, it didn't go along with them? Now, is that not asinine? That's never been done in American history. They can't find a single syllable that was uttered at the time, either in Congress, certainly not by the authors of the 14th Amendment, or the state ratification conventions. Not one person, not one sentence, nothing that supports their claim. They take completely out of context half of a sentence in the 14th Amendment in Section 4 that has absolutely nothing to do with today's budget, with today's debt, with today's spending. But the Democrats do not want to negotiate a reduction in spending. This is how presidents in the past have avoided this situation. But the Democrats today are more Marxist, more radical than ever before in our history. And they're saying, you do it our way, or we're attacking the economy. Now, they have their propagandists out there in the media. They have the likes of Hakeem Jeffries, who is a, who is a known liar, lied about his own past and supporting his uncle. And his uncle's anti-Semitic and anti-American statements. But more on that another day, as we've discussed it at length before. And now they're saying, the Republicans, 
are the ones who want to default on the economy. First of all, there'll be no default unless, unless the Secretary of the Treasury, at the direction of the President, insists on it. There's not only a number of measures to take. Money keeps flowing into the Federal Treasury. The next big amount of money flows in on June 15th. Now, the Treasury Secretary knows this. She's sitting in the building where they watch this. And that will be about 350 to $400 billion. Just as it did this month, and the month before, and the month before that, and every other month. The Democrats spend too much. The Republicans, under McConnell, voted to spend too much. The Democrats handed this to the Republicans before they were even sworn in as the majority. If the Democrats wanted to raise the debt ceiling, as McCarthy has said, why didn't they do it when they controlled both houses of Congress? They could have rammed it through, but they didn't. So the idea that somehow the 14th Amendment, a post-Civil War Amendment, Clause 4, talking about, yes, the debt that the United States owes to those who supported the Union. No, the debt to those who supported the Confederacy will not be paid. That somehow that applies to today, which of course it doesn't, is a lie. They're trying to rewrite the Constitution on the fly to do something that has never been even done before. Not by any president since the end of the Civil War. No president has asserted, as Joe Biden has, that he is the power of the purse. That he has the power to propose a budget and fund a budget. And raise the debt. Well then your House of Representatives might as well shut down. The members might as well leave town. Because that's their fundamental responsibility. They have others... But that's their fundamental responsibility. How many times have you heard the House is in charge of taxes? That's where the taxes, is, tax cuts or raises come from, or the spending cuts or raises come from. And that's a, It's the House. It doesn't say the presidency. Now, I want to show you what kind of a communist Jamie Raskin is. He was bred from a communist father. He was involved intimately in trying to remove Donald Trump, first trying to prevent him from being sworn in as one of a handful of objectors on the floor of the House. Then he worked both impeachment trials, both. Jamie Raskin, who's a, who's a red, and he's a liar, and he's on the morning schmo show today, and Joe Scarborough gives him a platform to lie, and Joe Scarborough, therefore, is lying with him. He knows damn well the 14th Amendment is not an option. Let's start. Cut seven. Go. Well, nobody seems to know, but um, the positive develop in my mind, development in my mind is that on the Democratic side, people understand that the 14th Amendment is not an option, as people have been saying. The 14th Amendment is an imperative. That the is 14th Amendment's not an option. It's an imperative, says Jamie Raskin. This clown was teaching constitutional law at one point, which means he was teaching lies. And there's nobody there to challenge him. The 14th Amendment provides no cover any more than the 13th or the 15th or any other amendment to the Constitution. The Constitution was not amended to eviscerate the House of Representatives. It's not an imperative, it's a fantasy. But the Marxists don't care. I've told you this a thousand times. They will turn the Constitution into a meaningless pretzel. That's what they'll do. They hate it from top to bottom. Because you cannot be a so-called progressive, a.k.a. Marxist, and support the American system. You cannot. Because the Constitution stands in your way. That's why they hate the First Amendment. That's why they hate the Second Amendment. There's Biden talking about the, the, the anniversary, such as it is, of the Uvalde massacre. Getting right back into the gun issue. Strengthen the schools, ladies and gentlemen. Strengthen them the way the White House is strengthened, the way Capitol Hill is strengthened. 
the way every federal building is strengthened. Do you care about the children the way I do, the way you do? Then demonstrate it. Tell me, how do we protect the White House? Do we disarm all the people who protect it? Is that what we do now? How do we protect the Capitol building? Do we tell the Capitol Police and so forth to go away and put up a sign that says a gun-free zone? No, of course not. But that's Biden today. Sick. Go ahead. Framework for analyzing the problem. And Section 4 says that the validity of the public debt shall not be questioned. No, it doesn't. Talks about the validity of the public debt, and then it talks about what is the public debt. Now, first of all, nobody's questioning the validity of the public debt. So he doesn't even know what he's talking about, this idiot. The public debt is valid, unfortunately, and it's massive. So nobody's talking about that. But it doesn't say in there anywhere, in plain English or even broken English, anywhere, that if Congress doesn't agree to raise a debt limit, the president has the unilateral power to issue loan instruments, like bonds and so forth. It doesn't even say, it doesn't even come close to it. It doesn't even make sense. Go ahead. For in the final analysis, the president must continue to pay the Social Security and Medicare recipients. Now, I explained Social Security and Medicare to you. I explained it on my Fox show. I explained it on Levin TV. I've explained it behind this microphone over and over, but put a sharp edge on it this week, last week. Social Security is a carve out. Why? At least theoretically, it has its own trust fund. It's funded completely differently. Medicare has its own trust fund. Now, what Jamie Raskin is saying is, no, they don't. We destroy those trust funds. So Jamie Raskin is talking at, God, I wish this guy would debate me. I would do anything. Could you invite him for the fourth time, Mr. Producer? Tell him I want to debate the 14th Amendment straight up. Good Lord. Cut eight, go. But I don't think uh, there will be legal challenges by the administration because the president doesn't have to challenge anybody. He just has to meet the full faith and credit of the United States. All right, idiot, uh, you're mumbling around. The president would be a defendant. He wouldn't bring a case. Is that what you were asked by the morning schmo or a schmoite who was filling in for him? the president who will be sued and let me tell you something this would be horrendous and then you'd have uh, what was the the woman's name from uh, Seattle the congresswoman Pallaby or whatever her name is Jayapal of the famous Jayapal 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 and Goldstein law firm anyway Jayapal she talks about the streets we're going to take to the streets oh yeah we're going to cue this up for the Supreme Court, and they better damn well do what we want. But he even says something stupider. Go ahead. Our creditors. Now, if Marjorie Taylor Greene or someone else wants to sue, they would have to prove that they have standing, which means they're injured by other people getting paid the money that the United States of America owes you them. You sound like a really big idiot, and I'm embarrassed to say they used to teach constitutional law. The House of Representatives would have standing because it has a cause of action. And what is the cause of action, ladies and gentlemen? A separation of powers that the President of the United States does not have the authority to do with the House of Representatives and, frankly, the broader Congress specifically authorized to do. So, of course, there would be standing but the guy sounds like a complete Marxist slash fascist. Not only can Biden do this, but nobody can challenge him. Oh, so Biden can do this. He can rip the shreds, the 14th Amendment and Article One, and nobody can stop him. Really? Now, let's think about this. Biden gets his way. According to Jamie Raskin, what happens next year budget time, Mr. Producer? 
Why does he even have to propose a budget to Congress? If he can fund it himself. Isn't that right, Rich? Why propose anything? Just say, here's my budget, and I'll be using the 14th Amendment to fund it. Okay, next issue. That's all he would have to do. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do you have to be a moronic, vile, poisonous, cancerous, radical, Marxist, not to understand this? This is how dangerous these people are. And then they blame the Republicans who are asking for just little reduction, just a little reduction in spending. And it's they who are going to destroy everything. If the Republicans don't give us what we want, we're going to use the 14th. It's not an option, it's an imperative, says Jamie Raskin. And Biden said the other day from Japan, he has the power. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now, I know you guys are worried. Federal Reserve staff said banking crises fallout could push the economy into recession this year. But you can do something about that. Learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for. I think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold IRA. That's right, physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you and they'll give you a free gold coin when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. I want to be very, very very clear about something, so even the moronic prebubescence at Media Matters and Mediocre I can understand what I'm saying. I have not asked to be tried out at 8 p.m. on Fox. I have no ability to do 8 p.m. at Fox because I do radio. And I haven't asked to do anything at Fox, even though they want to talk to me. Now, that said, Can you imagine me just saying one night, one night only, not five nights a week, not to try out, nothing, one hour, that's it, me and Jamie Raskin, me and Chris Christie, and maybe one or two others, that's it, I'm sure they wouldn't put me on after that anyway, but that said, a throwdown, wouldn't that be unbelievable, just a throwdown. One night, just one night. They won't come on. We've tried them this show, Sunday. I can't get them. But maybe then they'd come on. You never know. You never know. I can dream, can I? I'll be right back. Now, I know you guys are worried. Federal Reserve staff said banking crises fallout could push the economy into recession this year. But you can do something about that. Learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for. I think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold IRA. That's right, physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you, and they'll give you a free gold coin when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. Liberty's Voice, Mark Levin. Talk with that voice now. 877-381-3811. 
Damn right. So now having self-identified, although unwittingly perhaps, as a Marxist ideologue and with fascistic tendencies, Jamie Raskin then goes on to call Donald Trump essentially a fascist. And this is the nature of the beast, ladies and gentlemen. This is how it works. The Democrats positioning to sink the economy if they don't get what they want. But it's the fault of the Republicans for not approving what the Democrats want to do. Get the point? It's like book banning. My book can't be found in a high school in America. None of them. That's book banning. However, when you want to take out pornographic books out of elementary schools, according to Joe Biden and his ilk and the other perverts, uh, that's book banning. Get the drift? So here's Raskin. He's still on the morning schmo show. They, they give a platform for mental midgets and uh, other types of uh, very ill people, considering the hosts, you see. Cut nine, go. Yeah, I think that um, the chairman gave the game away. Chairman uh, Comer, he's talking about. Yeah, the chairman gave the game away. Go ahead, Jamie, go ahead. Yeah, I think that um, the chairman gave the game away. Uh, it was, I can't remember if it was yesterday or the day before, when he talked about how he felt that uh, his investigation uh, was improving Donald Trump's poll numbers for the 2024 Now let's stop for a second. Is that not why the Democrats went after Donald Trump, top to bottom, left to right? Is it? McCumber's not giving any game away, you moron. You should be interested, certainly the press should, regardless of you, of the information that they have uncovered. The press should be embarrassed that it hasn't uncovered it. And so rather than have any interest... For instance, he wasn't in. What about the 20 shell companies there, Mr. Raskin? What about the money that went through those shell companies, laundered, we used to call it, to nine family members, probably three unknowing grandchildren? And, of course, the other grandchild out in Arkansas is to be ignored completely. But that's okay with Raskin and the other reprobates. Anyway, go ahead thinking about the great former chairs of our committee, people like Henry Waxman and Elijah Cummings and Carolyn Maloney. Whoa, 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 whoa. Henry Waxman and the others? Henry Waxman was a hitman. Guy was about three feet, 12, not three feet, 11. And he took it out on any conservative or Republican administration. Henry Mac- Waxman, Elijah Cummings, Carolyn Maloney. Oh, there's another one. They weren't great leaders. But anyway, go ahead. None of them ever would have talked about measuring the success of our investigation. Fuck you, jerk. You schmo. None of them ever would have. What have I said over and over again? For the Democrat Party, it's party before country. You won't find that in the Republican Party. You just won't. But for the Democrat Party, you will. Because they figured it out, just like good communists. The party loyalty, party first. And anything that gets in the way must be destroyed. It must be crushed. Whether it's on Twitter or anywhere else, it's got to be crushed. And so Donald Trump gets the Donald Trump treatment. Ron DeSantis is going to get the Donald Trump treatment. This is a war, and they're at war with the Republican Party. They're at war with the American people. They're at war with the American system. As this guy rambles on and on. No wonder he's such a bastard coward who won't come on this program. No wonder. He doesn't want to be confronted and exposed for what he is. I've got some questions, Raskin. But you're a coward. You only go on that show. All the cowards, that's where they go. On the morning schmo with their 12 viewers. Can't say I blame him, Mr. Producer, can you? If you were me, would you come on my show? 
BLM paid. Well, before we get to BLM, let's go to IRS. We've got a whole alphabet soup of tyrants and grifters. Well, it's gotten worse. The IRS actually opened a tax investigation of Matt Taibbi. Now, Matt Taibbi is an independent journalist. He used to write for Rolling Stone. He's no friend of mine. I'm no friend of his. But nonetheless, principle is principle. Principle is principle. And so they open a probe on him Christmas Eve following the Twitter files document dump. Here's Stephen Nelson over at the New York Post. The IRS opened examination of journalist Matt Taibbi's 2018 tax return on Christmas Eve of last year, three weeks after he exposed sensitive documents about censorship at Twitter. Coincidence, ladies and gentlemen? Of course not. Are you kidding me? Those of you who have it, go back to unfreedom of the press and open the section there of presidential abuses of power. And you will see how the IRS was used by FDR. How the IRS was used by John Kennedy and Ben Bradley, by the way. How the IRS was used by Lyndon Johnson and then Nixon gives it a try. Oh, look at this. We've never seen anything like this, this Nixon. Oh, my God. There's a tapey system in the Oval Office. Nixon put a taping system. No, he didn't. He didn't put that in there. FDR put that in there. John Kennedy updated it, and then Lyndon Johnson updated it further. It was already in there. This isn't a defense of Nixon. This is an explanation of the Democrats. House Judiciary Committee released a letter today that sought more information from the government following revelations that an IRS agent was sent to TEB's home on March 9, 2022, the same day he testified to Congress about the Twitter files. But it's more. Now we know that they unleashed an investigation against the man. Jordan demanded even more records about the case as critics claimed the government was trying to intimidate him. The IRS asserted the committee that sent a letter to Mr. Taibbi on October 24, 2019, nine days after he filed his 2018 tax return, asking him to verify his return because it meant... (laughs) Identity theft criteria could not be processed until he confirmed. The IRS alleged that it sent a second letter to Taibbi on March 23, 2020. But according to Mr. Taibbi, neither he nor his account received any of these letters or any other notification that there was an issue with his 2018 tax return. That is, until the IRS conducted a field visit at Mr. Taibbi's home three years later. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the same Internal Revenue Service... Doesn't that sound very Stalinist? The same Internal Revenue Service that just yanked an entire unit that was investigating Hunter Biden because they complained of the politicization of the process by political hacks at the IRS and the DOJ. And here's Jamie Raskin. See, it's not just Trump, ladies and gentlemen. It's anybody that steps out. You're to march in line. Got to wear your black boots, your brown shirts, and you got to click those heels, baby. You have to march in line. That's what they insist on. Oh, it's true. And they can discredit or try to Trump and his family and his businesses. They can use it for political fodder. But don't you dare ask for a real investigation of the corruption of the Biden crime family, both in and out of government. No. That's political, you see. As I was saying, the Democrat Party identifies, like the Communist Party in most regimes that are communist, as being the pinnacle of power, not the government, The party. Because the party controls the government, not the other way around. That's why all these genocidal dictators, whether they be Marxists or fascists or something else, they're all chairman or secretary general or whatever of the Communist Party. Joe Biden is the leader of the Democrat Party. Maybe we need to start calling him the secretary general of the Democrat Party. 
This is why the Democrat Party wants to put the Republican Party out of business. This is why lame brains like Mitch McConnell haven't really figured out what's taking place. A little slow on the uptick. But that's exactly what's going on. And they're now interfering in their fourth election in a row. And now the, uh, the local Democrats have gotten the hang of it. You have a hack Democrat judge in Manhattan in a phony case brought by multimillionaire Alvin Bragg. And, oh, we're going we're gonna to start a trial in March, right in the middle of the primary season, interfering with a federal presidential election. It used to be that there was enough comedy, C-O-M-I-T-Y, enough comedy in existence that even the worst of the worst phony rogue judges, prosecutors, knew, knew better than to do that because they would, be, they would be roundly criticized and condemned, including by the radical kook media. But no, not anymore. Because they're playing for keeps and we're playing, and we're playing uh, poker. They're playing for keeps. And we're playing checkers. And so you have the DA in Atlanta who's interfering with the election. You have the DA in Manhattan who's interfering with the election. You have a judge in Manhattan who's interfering with the election. You have a rogue federal prosecutor who is doing to Donald Trump that what has never been done to a former president on a documents matter. Never. Uh, interfering with the election. And um, that's what's taking place. Now, you have the, the sort of hangers-on, the sort of leeches, like the Chris Sununus from New Hampshire, who's well-known for being a Sununu and nothing else, who looks like he's constantly on a sugar high or some high, just very painful to, to watch or listen to. And he's got one of those parts, you know, that start at the top of the right ear. And what's, what's that all about? Nonetheless, and then you have Chris Christie, who can barely sit in his chair. He's so excited. And, of course, uh, Weight Watchers didn't, didn't actually succeed with the gentleman. And I say that as a man who understands that, being the chairman of FU Fatties United. Nonetheless, he's ready to jump in with the big Chris Christie juggernaut. He just wants to get to the first debate so he can sign a bigger contract with ABC, uh, uh, with what's his ass, Stephanopoulos. That's all. That's all. But the Democrat Party wants all power coming through it. And the only way it can do that is through the centralization of government. This is a very diverse country. Geographically, economically, ethnically, religious. Very diverse country. With thousands of townships and villages and counties. And they seek to impose on top of the whole body politic, the entire nation, their ideology. And they can only do that by centralizing power. So they're not just Marxists, they're Marxist-Leninists. Because Lenin, among many, many other things, uh, he wrote and argued that this has to be a top-down revolution. That these poor people, these dumb bastards out there, excuse my French, they just don't get it. There's no people's revolution. There is a communist revolution. And there's the difference between a communist revolution and a people's revolution. And he knew it. Since only about 30% of the people backed the Russian revolution, most of the people were non-participants. And I'm sure afterwards they wish they were participants against the communists. Even the czar was better than the communists. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now, I know you guys are worried. Federal Reserve staff said banking crises fallout could push the economy into recession this year. But you can do something about that. Learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for. I think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold IRA. That's right. Physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you and they'll give you a free gold coin 
when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. People have to learn to push back, and they have to learn how to push back. Uh, can't be all uh, columns and writings back and forth. Sometimes you just need to uh, take these people on directly, look at their backgrounds. Like Jamie Raskin's gotten away with it for a long time. There's some kind of scholar. He's not a scholar. He's a hack. Comes from a family of Marxist hacks. Marxist hacks. That's what he is. And uh, you look at the leader of the, Rep- the Democrats in the House. His uncle was such a horrendous racist and anti-Semite, they had to remove him. And Hakeem came to the defense of his uncle when he was, he was post-bubescent. In other words, he wasn't some teenager. He was the head of one of the black organizations at an Ivy League college. And he invited his uncle to speak. He defended his uncle. He defended Farrakhan. It's something he's tried to cover up for decades. And now he's the leader of the Democrats. I can assure you that if Kevin McCarthy had had some role with the Klan or the neo-Nazis or David Duke or what have you, and at some point had praised them when he was in college, you know, you know that wouldn't be swept under the rug. That wouldn't be broomed. You know that. I know that. And yet it is. It's broomed when it comes from the, the Marxist left, when it comes from the Raskins of the world, when it comes to the, the, the Jeffries of the world. It's just... Uh, it is. It, it, it's disgusting. There's no point in whining about it, but we have to push back. Oh, I got to go now? We'll go now. we got a lot going on. We have our buddy Byron Donalds coming up next hour. Plus, I've got a lot more. And, of course, Governor DeSantis will be on here in hour 3, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. I'll be right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, Well, Tina Turner passed away, as you well know, and, you know, we hear different people of great accomplishment, entertainment and sports, politics pass away, really, almost a week or months certainly doesn't go by, but Tina Turner is a little different because she spanned, I think, several generations. She was really a fantastic entertainer, and it turns out she was a fantastic person. I didn't know her, obviously, but people who did know her said so. Very down-to-earth, no pretensions. Uh, She went through a lot in her life. I mean, her... uh, boyfriend, husband, uh, abused her. Even though he helped make her, he abused her. Uh, He beat her. Um, She lost two of her children, as I understand it. She she had a stroke because she didn't... Well, let me read this to you. From the New York Post. Tina Turner admitted that her health was in great danger just two months before her death. The legendary singer who passed away today at the age of 83 
after a long illness, opened up about the battle with kidney disease on March 9 in honor of International Kidney Day. So look, even up to that point, she was, you know, still communicative and so forth. She said, my kidneys are victims of my not realizing that my high blood pressure should have been treated with conventional medicine. She told her Instagram followers just two months ago, I have myself in great danger. I put myself in great danger by refusing to face the reality that I need daily lifelong therapy with medication. For far too long, I believe that my body was an untouchable and indestructible bastion. In an accompanying blog post for showyourkidneylove.com, she explained that she was diagnosed with hypertension in 1978. And at the time, she admitted she didn't care much about it and didn't really try to control it. 1985, she was prescribed pills that she was supposed to take daily to control it. She said, after suffering a stroke in 2009 because of my poorly controlled hypertension, I struggled to get back up on my feet. This is when I first learned that my kidneys didn't work that well anymore. They had already lost 35% of their function. Turner eventually developed a fatal dislike, she said, of her prescription pills and even convinced herself that they made her feel worse. So without consulting with her doctors, she replaced her conventional medication with homopathic remedies. She said, indeed, I'd started feeling better after a while. Uh, however, she was in for rude awakening when she went for her next routine checkup. She said, rarely in my life had I been so wrong. I had not known that uncontrolled hypertension would worsen my renal disease, and that I would kill my kidneys by giving up on controlling my blood pressure. I never would have replaced my medication by the homeopathic alternatives if I had had an idea how much was at stake for me. Thanks to my naivete, I had ended up at the point where it was about life or death. Turner's doctors made it very clear that the consequences for her decision were irreversible, informing her that her kidney function had reached its all-time low. She said the only option was to start dialysis, which was on for nine months. Went on for nine months. She said, but it was depressing to be connected to a machine for hours. Adding her second husband, Erwin Bach, offered to donate one of his kidneys to her. Though she felt lucky, she admitted that the very complex procedure in April 27 was followed by months of never-ending ups and downs as her body tried to reject the donor kidney, as it frequently happens after transplantation. So she did get the donor kidney uh, from her husband, Bach. And uh, let's see here, just scrolling down. Every so often, this required more hospital admissions, she wrote. I kept feeling nauseous and dizzy, forgot things, and was scared a lot. These problems are still not quite resolved. Remember, this was two months ago, she wrote on this. At the time, Turner insisted she was taking multiple prescriptions and following her doctor's orders meticulously. Today, Turner's team took to her Instagram to announce her death. It's with great sadness that we announced the passing of Tina Turner. With her music and her boundless passion for life, she enchanted millions of fans around the world and inspired the stars of tomorrow. Today we say goodbye to a dear friend, and so forth. And so Tina Turner's gone. <clears throat> you know, when you get older, these things matter more. Because you sort of mark periods in your life, you know, through your interactions with Obviously, your loved ones and other people and even interactions watching people perform on TV or listening on radio or whatever. It's like when Rush passed. Everybody remembers Rush. They remember where they were when they first heard him and when he announced his situation and so forth. <clears throat> but also, there's a very, very important lesson in this. And that is, 
Find a doctor who you trust, who's reputable. And many of these things are preventable. Or at least manageable. Many of these things are manageable. And they're even manageable through things like, and I should be one to talk, diet and stress and so forth and so on. But that's Tina Turner. And yes, she will be missed. All right. So there's a hearing held in the House because the Republicans are serious about trying to fare what the bureaucracy's up to. This is the way it's supposed to work. Look in these various regulations, you know, the, the goal of the left is to get rid of anything that runs on fossil fuels, the gas stove, furnaces, lawnmowers, automobiles. Uh, and then they want to, once things are attached to electricity, they want to destroy them. HVAC systems, an air conditioning window system, dishwashers, washing machines, dryers. You know, they used to say, stay out of the bedroom, but they don't believe that anymore. They want to be everywhere in your house. And they want to control everything you do. Because what they're in the business of doing right now is taking a disparate group of human beings and trying to corral them into a centralized hole where they can control us. They control how we live, then they control where we live, then they control how we use transportation, where we can use transportation, and what kind of transportation we can use. Just look at it. It's happening. It's opening up right in front of you. Right in front of you. So here is Cory Bush, who is a Marxist from St. Louis. Cut 11, go. I can only imagine the number of my constituents who are unknowingly being poisoned by their gas stove in the state so all of that a sudden, it is. All of a sudden, gas stoves are poisoning people. You see, they have to have a reason to do these things, and they're not going to tell you the truth. Get rid of that gas stove. You're killing yourself. You know, but for the Democrats and the cities they run, and the way they're attacking this society, you know, the, 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 the lifespan of an individual has increased every year, a little bit, a little. Now it's starting to decrease. It's starting to decrease. Because they're coming between us and human progress. They're coming between us and human progress. And life expectancy will continue to decrease. Because they're involved in the food chain. They're involved in the energy chain. They're involved in the lifestyle chain. And everything they're promoting is antithetical to human progress. Because they don't believe in human progress. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Remember the last time you got a quote unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four line requirements, and of course the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan with Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. It's always great to have our friend Byron Donalds on the program, superstar there in the House of Representatives. How are you? I'm doing good, my friend. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How's the family? 
Listen, family is good. You know, my oldest son is actually home uh, for a little bit of time, and I'm here in D.C. as, you know, we're dealing with debt ceiling and all this other foolishness up here. But, you know, things are good. And, and honestly, I think uh, our conference is actually holding strong, and I like where we are. You know, I, I think the key thing for people to know is that, you know, we're together, we're unified. I just want to make sure that that continues because I think we're in a really great spot. Boy, they thought they could roll you guys, didn't they? At the White House and the Democrats, they thought that some of you guys would peel off. Um, you pulled together. You've you've come up with a with a plan that is actually quite rational and conservative. And uh, the Democrats aren't sure what to do about it, right? I mean, you have some cuts in there, and then you want to limit the amount of increase for future years. And this is where they're going nuts, right? Absolutely. And look, first of all, if they thought we were going to just fold and not be successful, they didn't pay attention to the first week. Because I think we proved even in that first week as we went through, you know, that battle with Speaker McCarthy, that what Republicans are committed to is the House of Representatives actually doing its job and not just, you know, you know, putting out talking points and moving on. Uh, the second big thing is in that bill. Um, the spending cuts needed, getting rid of the student loan uh, craziness, the IRS agents, that's ridiculous. All that stuff is key. But one of the key components, and this is one that the White House wants, are these IRA subsidies. These IRA subsidies are to fund these 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 radical Green New Deal uh, companies run by these left-wing billionaires. And they want these these subsidies because this is the Democrats' way of achieve, achieving these Paris Climate Accord standards. Which, which, Mark, you and I know isn't going to do anything for the climate. It's a, it's a shell game. And even the Europeans are starting to backpedal off this Green New Deal stuff because it was easy to be green when you were getting your oil and gas from Russia. And when you got to figure out your own energy matrix, they're realizing this stuff doesn't work. So those are the things that are in our bill. It's important that we hold firm. And I think the American people are with us. Even CNN's having to report that one uh, because people realize, look, if you're going to raise debt, you might need to address your spending. And I think the American people are there. And so I like our position a lot better than their position. Tell us, uh, expand on this, because I'm not from IRA subsidies. What's going on there? So the Inflation Reduction Act, or what we you know call it, the Inflation No, Re- no Reduction Act, um, what that actually did, it was the Green New Deal's little sister. That's yeah, really what the yeah. bill is. In there, they put in these, these subsidies specifically for green energy, right? The CBO said that it was going to cost about $309 billion. But Goldman Sachs did their own estimate, and they said it's actually going to cost $1.2 trillion oh, because all these companies were going to be formed and they were going to apply for uh, the subsidies. So even this morning on uh, on uh, MSNBC, they're talking about, oh, yeah, a lot of people are applying for these subsidies. And they're saying this is great because these green energy projects that were not economically viable before, because of the tax credits, they're now economically viable. And this is the stuff that the White House, for, in my view, they're saying is the holy grail. And so I think it's important that we hold the line on that stuff because we cannot turn our energy grid, our electric grid, over to green energy. It's not sustainable. We're going to have blackouts and brownouts through our country. And, Mark, Mm -hmm. one last thing to add on this. We had a hearing on this gas stove uh, banned by the EPA, another ridiculous thing. And we're telling them that if you went to all electric stoves and all electric cars and you have uh, solar panels and windmills powering our grid, we're going to have blackouts and brownouts in our country. There's Mm -hmm. not enough electricity on the grid for their crazy ideas. And it's important that we hold the line on this stuff right now. 100 percent. And they're attacking the grid. They're making it much more difficult for public utilities. They're attacking them. In other words, they're attacking every part of the uh, of the horizontal functioning of our energy system from production to usage, from from production to automobiles to lawnmowers. Some of them want to get rid of and on and on and on. These people are ideologues, aren't they, Byron? They don't have the foggiest idea what they're doing, do they? No, they don't. Listen, I was in, in our committee today, uh, Corey Bush, she's the ranking member, and she's just going on and on about how, oh, this is going to help black and brown uh, people fight climate change in their own in their own houses. 
And I'm looking at her like, did you ever ask black and brown people what the cost would be for getting rid of gas stoves and a technological cost going to be borne by them having to buy these mm-hmm. new stoves? What if you have to remodel your kitchen because it's got a natural gas hookup and it doesn't have an elect- electricity cord hookup because you can't just plug it into any regular old socket. It's a special socket for electric stoves. So they don't know what they're talking about. This is this is all this radical dogma at, at the at the at, at I guess their current God, which is the Green New Deal. But at the mm-hmm. end of the day, it's about power. It's about their agenda. They do not care what it means to the average American, but we do, and that's what conservatives are fighting for on your show up here on Capitol Hill and throughout the states where conservatives either have a majority or trying to hold off the, the, the radicalness of the less left in some of these other states. Have you noticed when you go on these other shows, these these other media platforms, because I see that you're trying to reach out to more and more people and different, uh, you know, who watch different programs and so forth, with CNN, I think it was mm-hmm. Meet the Press, some of these. You notice they don't want you to get your point across. They just cut you off or they <laughs> distract you or, or try to distract you. Have you noticed they don't want to have an honest, substantive discussion? You haven't had one yet on any of these platforms. No, they definitely don't want they don't want that because if you have a detailed discussion about their policy, they realize that it's a failure and they're going to lose. But the reason why, you know, I told my district when I was running for Congress that if I'm your congressman, I'm going to take our message everywhere because there are people who listen. I think your show is great. Obviously, one of the best. I've been a listener for a long time, Mark. But there are people who don't listen to your show. I don't know why, but they don't. <laughs> and I think that we got to take our message everywhere. Well, we ought to give them a tax credit if show. they listen. We ought to give them a tax credit. <laughs> <laughs> why not? Everybody else gets but, one. Just kidding. I agree. But taking but you're the message, right. I think, is critical. And but we got to do right. that, and that's, that's what I'm going to do. If I read the New York Times and watch these other shows, I don't know what the hell's going on. I really don't know what's going on. I'm being fed a real... Uh, a real lot of other stuff. Now, what about immigration here? I mean, Joe Biden is all in. This just won't stop. Honestly, unless the president is going to help stop, it makes it tough to stop what's going on on the border. So I don't know what what can be done. Well, look, my solution is actually the solution of myself, Chip Roy, a lot of members, the members of the Freedom Caucus, and actually a lot of members. We're saying that since Joe Biden doesn't live in reality when it comes to the debt ceiling, we should ump the ante. We should add in the uh, the border security bill we just passed off the House floor and add that into the debt ceiling bill and say, listen, you want to raise $4 trillion to, to, to get the national debt passed the next election? Well, then you need to secure the border because that, that unsecured border is not just costing red states. It's costing blue states. Everybody's suffering under this. So I think that's one of the strategies that we can use to actually get this thing done, even with a knucklehead like Biden in office. Got a couple more questions, Byron. Won't take too long. You can hold on with us. We'll be right back. Remember the last time you got a quote unquote free phone? You started out feeling great. Then came the hefty activation fees, four line requirements, and of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan with Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. Mark Levin, the thunder on the right. Call in now, 877-381-3811. We are here with Byron Donalds of Florida. Byron Donalds, uh, how has uh, Kevin McCarthy's leadership been? You know, Mark, I'll tell you, it's, it's, been, it's been really good. You know, we've had a very uh, open dialogue here in the House. 
um, you know, with members in the speaker, with different groups of, of our conference with the speaker and everything that we've been doing, you know, a lot of this stuff is being worked on uh, together in collaboration. And, you you know, that's only possible if, if your leader, if your speaker allows that. And he's allowed that. And then the second piece is, is that um, when we go and take what we're doing to the American people, he's done a tremendous job. So I think he's doing great. Um, I think that he just needs to continue to just do what he's doing. And when we have these engages with the White House, you know, frankly, I, I try to tell my colleagues, oh, my like, guys, we can't look at these debates with the White House like we're dealing with Barack Obama. I mean, this is Joe mm-hmm. Biden. They can't even stand this guy out in front of the press. He doesn't even mm-hmm. talk to the press. So let's do it. Let's have national debates with him. We'll win those. Um, but I think he's done a really good job in doing that, leading our conference. And we think it's going to continue. And I think because of all this, he's become very popular with the Republican Party and the people. That is, he's probably, and thanks to guys like you, and but him too, uh, the most conservative speaker we've had since and Newt Gingrich, wouldn't you say? I mean, Bonnier and uh, Paul Ryan was a huge disaster and disappointment. And I don't know. I've talked to him. He just seems really happy about where he is right now. No, I agree. And, and, I, and again, I think... I don't want to under, understate the importance of the collaborative environment he's he's really had here with us because we're engaging with his leadership team and then engaging with the other members of the conference. Some of these policy issues uh, that there were previous disagreements on in the past that just get lost on the shelf or tossed on the floor because not everybody understood it or, or could get their arms around it or figure out how to message back home on it. We're figuring that stuff out as a Republican conference. So we're mm-hmm. putting forward the best package possible, and it gives the speaker room to negotiate and to really lead. And I think that's a credit to him because, like I said, it's easy to be you know, a, a dictator in the speaker's office, but to really work with all the members is hard work, and he's been committed to that. And uh, how, how's it going in Florida? You know, these hurricanes come and go. The American people watch it for a week or two, and then we never hear anything about it. How's the rebuilding going in your district? Well, look, my, this, is, this is really about the constituency. They have been working hard since, you know, day one after the storm. It's going, it's going pretty well. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Our biggest issue, frankly, has been FEMA and, and the SBA. I mean, FEMA, up until a, two weeks ago, were telling uh, my constituents who were living in travel trailers that they had to get out of them by August 1 because FEMA was concerned about uh, the new hurricane season. And we were pushing back on FEMA saying, what are you talking about? There's this thing called Doppler radar. We have a national hurricane center that we fund with, 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 with millions, tens of millions of dollars. We know when a storm is coming. So if there's a storm coming, you know, we can hook the trailers up to, a, to something and haul them out of there and get them out of harm's way. Um, we think they're starting to reverse course because we've been putting the pressure on. And in SBA, they, they've approved these disaster recovery loans, but they're not funding them. The, the dumbest thing in well, the what world good does that do? is going to give them lending authority. Exactly. And so people at home, they're doing the job. Our county commission, our local leaders, our people, they're rebuilding as fast as they can. Things are looking a lot better uh, than even I thought they would be. But the federal government, man, I, I got to tell you, like we, we have some serious reforms we need to do in mm-hmm. these agencies because they're a joke. And yet it must make you nervous. It makes me nervous with the home that we have on the eastern side. They say it's going to be a bad hurricane season. I mean, uh, that's no fun. Yeah. Uh, now, all this no, said, no fun, but yeah. Now, all this said, Byron. Here's the thing: climate change. Um, what is the perfect temperature for the Earth? Do we have one? Do we know what it is? No, I have no idea. Nobody does, do they? And when they say the ocean no. has risen seven to eight inches since 1890. Some guy wrote a great piece. He said, the ocean's 12,080 feet deep. We don't know if uh, since 1890 the ocean has risen seven to nine inches. That's smaller than your foot. Nobody knows that for (laughs) sure. All of this is crap. That's why they, they have to impose their will on us like good little Leninists from the top down. They're going to destroy the automobile industry. They're going to destroy what was the energy independence. 
They're going to destroy mobility. They're going to force people into smaller and smaller homes. They're already reaching into our homes trying to control various appliances and so forth. They're trying to control the automobile. This is not a joke. This is not a conspiracy. These people are serious about this stuff, aren't they? They really are. Mark, to quote a phrase you've said so many times on your show, it's an authoritarian mindset because they believe wholeheartedly they are right. They've created these outside groups who create feedback with the research or that the, the, the pseudo research they want to see. It reinforces their worldview. Their world they have this compliant lapdog media that's in the tank that only wants to regurgitate the talking points they want. And then if people begin to challenge, they shut them down, they ignore them. And if the press actually has questions, they just ignore the press. And then they wait for one one moment in time where they, they might have the votes and they ram it all through, no questions asked. If that is something that is against liberty and freedom, I don't know what is. And it's, it's really bad for our country. And unfortunately, a lot of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they're serious about this stuff. And too many of them haven't even dug into the information to really question if this is going to be viable and actually work for the American people. You know, uh, you're an example of really uh, how America is supposed to function. I want you to remind people, because it's easy to forget, You weren't always a conservative. You didn't always have these views. Then you really started to read and look into this stuff. And that's very, very important that you that that leading by example. Explain explain to people how you came to your conclusions now. I came to really uh, conservatism uh, through my career, through economics. Like I'm a finance major by trade. I worked in the financial industry. And when I first started looking at politics, you know, what the talking points were, they didn't make any sense at all to me. And so I really started to read about the history of politics, the, re- the history of, of, of liberalism and conservatism. And that political philosophy made sense to me. So you marry the political philosophy with an economic philosophy, you know, based upon F.A. Hayek and Milton Freedom, and that's really the essence of of modern conservatism. And from there, that's where I got my views from. I I tell people briefly, Mark, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. And if it makes money for people and people can earn it and grow it for themselves, that's something that's sustainable. You can build on that. If you got to run to some government to get a, a quasi subsidy and all these rules that shut out a bunch of people, that's not sustainable and it doesn't work and it only causes more dislocation for a country. But that came through just reading and analyzing stuff and frankly listening to shows like yours and um, and just taking the time to think this stuff through, having debates with people and really deciding that you know what this is the policies I can stand behind and this is the philosophy I can get behind and that was my journey. You know, it's my journey, too. As a, uh, as a teenager, starting to read Mises and Hayek and Freeman, used to watch Freeman on PBS, used to watch Bill Buckley, then got National Review. It really does, it really makes a difference. And, and I'm pointing this out because there's a lot of great people who came before us, and we can learn from them, and that's part of conservatism. It's also part of faith that the world doesn't begin today. And we don't have a bunch of brand new ideas. We have to take our principles and apply them to what's taking place today. But these principles are forever, are they not? They are forever. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to have a country, and look, America is the greatest country in the world by far. Everybody born here, they got the Willy Wonka golden ticket. Mm -hmm. Being born here is better than being born anywhere else. But the only way any society can, can, can continue itself is that you have to have sound principles of economics that allow your country to thrive. You have to have sound principles of governing, which keep your government limited and focused on the job it should do and no more. And you have to have sound principles of individual liberty and respect for individual liberty so people can can live their lives, speak their speak their values, um, organize themselves, grow their families, and then you just rinse and repeat. And if you have that, you can have a successful society. And America has that. It's not always been perfect, but America has that. And, if, and I think the battle right now is to make sure that we keep that. All right. Fantastic. Well, Byron Donalds, we appreciate you, buddy. Keep it up. And thanks very much. Listen, anytime, Mark. All right. God bless, man. 
There he is, Byron Donalds, and he's the real deal. What a great guy. Remember when we, when I first called your attention to him, Mr. Producer? There was some press conference, like, a, was it two years ago, something like that? A year and a half ago. Maybe it was on the budget. I don't remember. No, I think it maybe, it was, maybe it was on Trump. But anyway, there were like six people talking, and he comes up and he speaks. And honestly, I said, who the hell is that guy? It's Byron Donalds. And uh, he's definitely one of the sharpest guys up there, too. It's just exciting to see him on these other shows. I don't watch these other shows. We get clips of them, but uh, it's good. In fact, as I think, we ought to have a team of the smartest and the most articulate conservatives um, who insist on going on all these programs. Don't you think, Mr. Producer? And swap them. And just say, okay, we're ready. All weekend, every weekend. And have like 10, 12, 20 of them. There aren't many more, trust me. But those, you know, the stars. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Remember the last time you got a quote unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four line requirements, and of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan. With Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. In 40 minutes, ladies and gentlemen, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, the first and only interview by, uh, by a movement conservative, i put it that way, of a conservative, that would be Ron DeSantis, will take place at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and it is the first and exclusive radio interview since his announcement for president as well, so you won't want to miss that. President Trump's lawyers, and these are good lawyers, they wrote a letter to the Attorney General of the United States. And they said in this letter, look, no president has been treated this way over documents. We have a whole line of presidents who took documents with them, and some of them were classified, and so forth and so on. There weren't criminal investigations. There is a process for negotiating. There's an administrative process. And that's the way it's supposed to work. But instead, the Biden administration triggered a criminal investigation. I don't care what Bill Barr says. He's irrelevant. He's become a blowhard. And I don't care what the legal analysts have to say. You take a document case and now you've turned it into a criminal case where you've a warrant where you used FBI SWAT team, that should show you how out of control and how they're targeting Trump. Anyway, in their letter, they say, hey, look, we would like to meet with you, Mr. Attorney General. What's being done to our client is really outrageous. It's unprecedented through this quote-unquote special counsel. And by the way, there's nothing special about this guy. Quite the opposite. And it's already leaked out that his investigation is winding down. He's just dotting the I's and crossing the T's. And this is a huge problem. Again, the, the DOJ and the FBI interfering with an election. And it is outrageous. As I've said before, this is a document case. And to turn this into a criminal case is really appalling. More when I come back. And don't forget, Governor DeSantis... An exclusive one radio interview today, which you'll be doing in a half hour on this program. I'll be right back. He's here. 
is here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Are you kidding me? Remember this gentleman, gentleman, who uh, was in the uh, Capitol building and he put his foot on Pelosi's desk. Remember him, Mr. Producer? And um, it's an Arkansas man. And um, he was just sentenced to four and a half years in prison. Four and a half years in prison? I mean, folks, seriously? These are the people who are going after Trump, the prosecutors. There's a fantastic piece at The Federalist by an excellent thinker and writer, Mar- Margot Cleveland. The left's 2020 fake electors narrative is fake news. And yet this is one of the things that the prosecutors in Atlanta and Washington are focused on. And she says, and by the way, Governor DeSantis will be on this program in uh, 23 minutes. The 2020 Georgia situation mirrors events of 60 years ago in Hawaii revealing that everything the media have said about fake electors is wrong. Headlines recently proclaimed that eight of Trump's fake electors, so-called, accepted immunity deals. Of course, reporting the news, the corporate outlets all missed the real story, that the electors testimony failed to incriminate anyone, including Trump, and that the county prosecutors engaged in a massive misconduct. Equally appalling, however, was the corrupt media's continued peddling of the so-called fake electors narrative. There were no fake electors. There were contingent Republican electors named consistent with legal precedent to preserve the still ongoing legal challenges to the validity of the Georgia certified vote. Nor was appointing an alternate slate of electors some cockamamie plan devised by Trump's lawyers. On the contrary, Trump's election lawyers and the contingent electors followed the precise approach Democrats successfully used when the date Congress established for certifying an election came before the legal challenges John Kennedy had brought in Hawaii were decided. And that approach allowed Kennedy to be certified the winner of Hawaii's three electoral votes on January 6, 1961, even though the Aloha State had originally certified Richard Nixon the victor. The Hawaii scenario in 1960 mirrors in every material respect The facts on the ground in Georgia on December 14, 2020, the date both the Democrat and Republican presidential electors met and cast their 16 electoral votes for Joe Biden and Donald Trump, respectively. Election Day in 1960 fell on November 8 and pitted Kennedy, a Democrat, against Republican Nixon. The outcome remained unknown for some time, with a total of 93 electoral votes from eight different states undecided. The days following the election, Hawaii was one of those states. Yeah, Hawaii started out as a Republican state, but good luck there now. By December 9 of that year, Kennedy had accumulated enough electoral votes to win the White House. But Hawaii's winner was still in question. And while the presidency did not depend on Hawaii's three electoral votes, Democrats there had challenged the initial returns that gave Nixon a 141 vote edge. 0.08% margin of victory. Based on the original count in favor of Nixon, the acting governor of Hawaii, Republican James Kiloa, certified the Republican electors on November 28, 1960. On December 13, over the objections of the state attorney general, state circuit court judge Ronald Jameson ordered a recount. Then on December 19, both the Kennedy and Nixon electors met. Quote, cast their votes for president and vice president and certified their own meeting and votes, unquote. In casting their electoral ballots for Kennedy, the three Hawaiian Democrats certified they were the duly and legally qualified and appointed electors for president and vice president for the state of Hawaii, and that they had been certified as such by the executive. And the Hawaii electors further attested, quote, we hereby certify the list of all the votes of the state of Hawaii 
given for president, all the votes given for vice president are contained herein. Two of the three Democrat electors were retired federal judges. Uh, William Heen and Delbert Metzger. And Heen personally mailed the Democrat electoral votes to Congress on December 20. In fact, the envelope containing the certificates further attested, we hereby certify that the lists of all the votes of the state of Hawaii given for president are contained herein. So in other words, the Democrats set in their electors, they said the count was taken in the state, and that we certify that these are the true electors for president and vice president, and they sent them in. Ten days later, on December 30, 1960, Judge Jameson held that Kennedy had won the election. So holding Jameson stressed the importance of the Democrat electors that had met in December 19 as prescribed by the Electoral Count Act to cast their ballots in favor of Kennedy. That step allowed Hawaii governor to then certify Kennedy as the winner of Hawaii's three electoral votes and in turn Congress to count Hawaii's electoral votes in favor of Kennedy. The Georgia situation in 2020 mirrored the events of 60 years ago in Hawaii. Election Day in 2020 fell on November 3, although then many ballots had already been cast given the adoption of mass mail-in and early voting. Trump had a lead in Georgia until the morning of Friday, November 6, when Biden overtook the incumbent. With the margin remaining tight on November 11, Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger announced a statewide audit. Following the audit, Biden remained in the lead by approximately 12,000 votes, leading Raffensperger to certify the election results on Friday, November 20. Republican Governor Brian Kemp signed the certification the same day. Then, on November 21, Trump requested a recount, as allowed under Georgia law, given the closeness of the count. On December 4, 2020, then-President Trump and Republican elector David Schaefer filed suit in Fulton County State Court against Raffensperger, arguing tens of thousands of the votes counted to the president election had been cast in violation of Georgia law. And while Trump's lawsuit was still pending on December 7, based on the recount, Raffensperger recertified Burden is, Bard, excuse me, Burden is right. Biden is the winner of Georgia's 16 electoral votes by a margin of 11,779. Trump and Schaefer's Fulton County lawsuit contesting the election results remained pending on December 14, the date the presidential electors were required by federal law to meet. Thus, while the Democrat electors met and cast their ballots for Joe Biden, the Republican electors met separately and cast their 16 votes for Trump. At that time, Schaefer made clear that Trump electors had met and cast their votes to ensure Trump's legal battle in court remained viable. Nonetheless, following Biden's election, Fulton County Prosecutor Fannie Willis targeted the Republican electors as part of her criminal special purpose grand jury investigation. While the grand jury has since issued a report and been disbanded, Willis agreed to grant immunity to eight of the electors, likely to pressure them, she says push, but I mean pressure, to implicate the other electors. However, their lawyer confirmed in a court filing that none of the electors implicated anyone in criminal activity. Since then, Schaefer's attorneys, Holly Pearson and Craig Gillen, wrote D.A. Willis a detailed letter reviewing the Florida, excuse me, the Hawaii president. The attorneys noted that they had made three prior written requests to, quote, meet to discuss the factual and legal issues relevant to Schaefer's role as a contingent Trump elector but had not received any response to those requests. So the DA will not meet with the lawyers. This is extraordinary. Let's see if the Attorney General will meet with Trump's lawyers on the document situation. The 11-page single-space letter then proceeded to detail both the Hawaii precedent for Schaefer's actions following the 2020 election and the legal advice the Republican elector received that, quote, he and the other contingent presidential electors should meet at the state capitol building on December 14 and perform the duties of a presidential elector to preserve potential remedies in the event Trump et al. versus Raffensperger et al. was successful. In other words, they didn't undermine or obstruct 
what was taking place, they said, wait a minute. We have our own group of electors. And if they hadn't sent in their group of electors, and there was a successful lawsuit or recounting, and the electors weren't there, then Georgia wouldn't have had any electors. That's not obstructing the lawful process from one administration to a new administration. And as I've said before, there's no reason to criminalize these things. They don't belong in, in a grand jury or a second grand jury or in another jury. They don't belong in the hands of a DA or any prosecutor, just like the documents case. It's not a criminal case turning into obstruction and all the rest. It's an administrative case. In addition to detailing the Hawaii precedent from 1960, Schaefer's lawyers highlighted the fact that in contesting the 2000 election, lawyers for then-Democrat presidential candidate Al Gore cited that very precedent to support his position that two elector uh, slates could be appointed, two elector slates. In fact, Democrat Representative Patsy Mink of Hawaii suggested the 2000 Florida electoral dispute be resolved based on that Hawaiian precedent. And three Supreme Court justices in Bush versus Gore cited the Hawaiian precedent as a basis for allowing the Florida recount to proceed. As the letter in Hawaii precedent made clear, Schaefer And the other Trump electors not only did nothing wrong, but they acted prudently to ensure that if the state court lawsuit resolved in the president's favor, Georgia's electoral votes would be properly counted on January 6th. Here we see one of the only differences between Trump's legal challenge and Kennedy's. The Hawaii state court promptly resolved the merits of Kennedy's legal challenge while in violation of of the Georgia Election Code that requires lawsuits contesting elections to be heard within 20 days, the Fulton County Court delayed assigning a judge to hear Trump's election dispute and then delayed the first scheduled hearing until January 2021, two days after Congress certified Biden the winner of the 2020 election. Now you know the rest of the story. There were no fake electors. The question now is whether Willis will charge Schaefer and others with fake crimes. Margot Cleveland. Absolutely brilliant and 100% right on. And I'm going to hold on to this piece. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. See, but here's what the prosecutor in Atlanta knows. Her jury won't give a damn about Hawaii, won't be told about Hawaii. These are legal fights, not factual fights. Uh, And so, again, we have the criminalization, not of politics, of Donald Trump for living and breathing and deciding to be in politics. That's what we have. The Arkansas man who was photographed on January 6th with his feet on the desk of Speaker then Speaker Pelosi was sentenced today to four and a half years in prison. Prosecutors had asked the judge to sentence him to more than seven years. More than seven years. They noted in a court filing that a picture of a smiling Barnett lounging in Pelosi's office became one of the best known images of that day, and so he should get seven years or more. Barnett's lawyers had argued he shouldn't get more than six months. He's a 63-year-old retired firefighter and bull rider from rural Arkansas who came to D.C. for his very first time. They said to peacefully protest, he was unfortunately caught up in the events. U.S. District Judge Christopher Cooper disagreed, sentencing him to 54 months in prison. Barnett was convicted in January on eight charges stemming from the Capitol attack, including theft of government property, entering and remaining in a restricted building on grounds with a deadly or dangerous weapon. And what weapon was that? In addition to the stun device, he armed himself with a 10-pound 
steel pole, prosecutors said. He armed himself with a 10-pound steel pole. How much you want to bet, Mr. Producer, he grabbed it from the suite outside the office? But he armed himself? So he came armed with a 10-pound steel pole? Is that it? He also acknowledged leaving what he later called a nasty note for Pelosi. Although that's worth four and a half years right there. Barnett expressed remorse for his action when he took the witness stand in his own defense. I shouldn't have put my feet on the desk. At that time, I thought it was funny. But after reflection, it seems crass. So they throw the book at him. And it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough, you see, for the prosecutors. That's what we're up against, America. Sorry. And Donald Trump's facing the same thing, but worse, actually. Much worse. Four and a half years. We have people in our cities who are committing acts of violence, or breaking into people's stores, stealing things, breaking into their homes and stealing things. We have people who are raping and marauding people who are recidivists in the front door of the courthouse, out the back. You don't get four and a half years for putting their feet on the speaker's desk. Was that good? No. Should he have done it? No. But everything they've thrown at him is not worth four and a half years, not in my view. I'll be right back. The only constitutional lawyer you can see today for free. No appointment necessary. Just call him at 877-381-3811. You know, ladies and gentlemen, Ron DeSantis is to be on the show right now, but Trey Gowdy is going over on Fox. And he's going to keep going over on Fox, I think. Uh, They get ratings up that way, but... Uh, The fact is, he's supposed to be on this program, and um, what he's doing here, that is, Trey, is really not not the way you deal with a colleague. So as soon as he does get off Fox, he will be on this program, uh, Governor DeSantis, as people have assured us that they're trying to make that happen. And, um, And we will wait till that happens. But he's going to bleed this as long as he can. There's no question about it. I'm talking about Trey. I'm not dying to be on this show, that show, that time, this time. In fact, I got to figure out how to how to peel back somewhere. What am I doing, Hillsdale? Okay. All right. I don't want to jump into something too heavy here, but I will jump into a little as we wait for uh, Trey Gowdy to cut it out um, at some point, I guess, here. FBI refuses to provide subpoenaed document on alleged Biden criminal schemes. So Christopher Wray is digging in. He doesn't believe Congress has the right uh, to oversee the FBI uh, with his phony, you know, uh, processing arguments. And the uh, fact of the matter is that they're going to have to take this up all the way to the Supreme Court if they have to, I think. Because they cannot allow the FBI to be a rogue operation that doesn't adhere to uh, oversight responsibilities of uh of Congress. I mean, Congress is in the Constitution. The FBI is not. And uh, this FBI whistleblower, you know, it's amazing to me how much leeway the whistleblowers got under the Democrat Congress. Under Pelosi, they were coming out of the woodwork. They were really hacks, political ideologues. And um, this is the best they could do. And when it comes to, of course, now, the whistleblowers are not to be believed in the media, of, of course, are part of this, too. No question about that. So, um, oh, all right. Well, it's nice. We have the uh, America's governor now on the program. I'm glad Trey Cowdy uh, decided to stop at some point. Uh, but that's just <laughs> me. Uh, governor. First of all, it's an honor to have you. You broke the Internet, uh, Governor. You uh, you shut down the Internet with all the people who wanted to watch your announcement. You're aware of that, aren't you? Oh, it was the biggest uh, number of people they've ever had on a Twitter deal. Tons people told my folks that um, massive numbers that were joining, like every minute, that just totally jammed. So 
We're, we're really excited about the enthusiasm. The number of people go uh, to rondesantis.com and make a contribution. I want to thank everybody. Encourage your listeners uh, to do the same thing. So uh, we're pleased to have been able to break the Internet and be able to reach people directly without necessarily doing the traditional campaign rally. Well, I think that's right. And now you got a real audience. It's a big audience, 14 and a half million people who want to hear from you. Let me, let me start with this. When I interviewed you for your book, you said some things that I felt were, vi- were really very, very uh, compelling. And I don't think you'll be asked much about, about this, so I'll ask you. Your management style is different than most. In other words, you really do laser target things and decide how you want to approach them and how to get things done which is what conservatives want from a Congress and a president. What is your approach? So, Mark, we have all these things that you and I believe, your listeners, our shared principles and values, and we have a sense of what that would look like in public policy. And the idea is, okay, get that if you're in office and get that through a constitutional system so that it can stick and become the policies that that govern our state or our country. And so what I do is, as governor, I studied all the authorities that I possess, constitutionally, statutorily, customary policies. I knew what I needed the legislature for, what I didn't, local government vis-a-vis me. And the same thing would apply to the presidency. You understand Article II powers. You understand where your leverage points are. You understand your statutory authority. You also have to be willing to assert the true scope of Article II powers, and I think a lot of our presidents have not been willing to do that, for example, vis-a-vis the administrative state. The founding fathers would have never accepted the idea that you could get elected president, and yet the executive agencies could do whatever the hell they wanted to do. That is not Mm -hmm. the way this works. And so, you know, I view kind of the task at hand for us is the reconstitutionalization of our government. I think we need to return the government to its rightful owners, which is we the people. The only way you'll get that done, though, is if you go in with a clear plan on day one, you spit nails right out of the gate. And I think you really need two terms to be able to do it eight years, because every time you make a movement, you fire someone, it's going to be contested by the left. There's going to be lawsuits. There's going to be this. And you've just got to be disciplined. You've got to be determined. But I don't see any other way around it, Mark, because if we keep going in this direction, then you can elect people to Congress, you can elect a president, and all the important issues get decided by unelected bureaucrats. We don't govern ourselves if that's the case. Mm -hmm. Your wife, Casey, who we know, my family knows, we adore you guys. She's just just wonderful. She she suffered from cancer. Um, She got through that. And uh, you have three young kids and you're raising them as well as uh, as well as being a husband and and governor and you're running for president now. And she's been by your side the whole way. And it's interesting to me that the corrupt media now are doing something they never did to Michelle Obama or Jill Biden. They're attacking your wife for crying out loud. What's that like? I, we, we knew that this was, would happen because if she were a Democrat, she'd be on free fashion magazine. Yeah. They would be making her to be the biggest deal. But because we're conservative, we know that that's not what will happen. In reality, it'll be the opposite where they try to really attack. But the reason they're attacking her is because they know she is an incredibly effective first lady. She's somebody that people look up to, not just women, although many of the women in Florida who've gone through breast cancer look at her uh, as a role model for how she handled it. Uh, She's made huge uh, improvements to communities in Florida by helping underprivileged people. And she believes in the values of this country, and she can articulate that in a way that people really get excited about. And so she's uh, my best friend. Uh, She's a great wife, a great mother. But I'll tell you, When I'm out there on a campaign trail, there is nobody I would rather have by my side Mm -hmm. than Casey DeSantis. And the the corrupt media knows that. They know she's good, so they're going to try to fabricate stories about her. But the reality is our voters see through this. They know the only reason they're going after her is because she's effective. They know when they're doing the anonymous sources uh, that it's all fabricated uh, BS. And so... We take it in stride. We know this is just something that that happens when you get into these things. 
you know, look, as a husband, I don't mind when they go after me because I know. I mean, it is frustrating uh, to see. But I think the media is so corrupt and, and people distrust it so much that I don't think it makes a ripple with Republican and independent voters because I think they see right through it. You know, uh, you're probably, in terms of being, I would argue you're a movement conservative, the, uh, the, the next movement conservative after Reagan. I think Trump is more sort of a common sense or comes to this thing from, uh, from more experience. But you're there, you're ready to go, day one from a principal point of view, capitalism, liberty, private property rights, unalienable rights, and so forth and so on. Don't you think that distinguishes you from most politicians? Because you've been governor now five years, going on six years, and and you've stuck to your principles, your 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 founding principles, your conservative principles, and you've used them during governing. So it's not just a white paper thing. It's not just a debate society. You've actually showed how to make them work. Mark, I, I resolved going into the governor's office almost five years ago that I would not do a single poll about an issue to kind of tell me what to think. And I've kept that. I've not done a poll about any of the issues I've tackled uh, because they don't come from a position of me putting my finger in the wind and trying to contort myself to conform to whatever sudden breeze of passion may be out there with the public. You know, what I'm doing comes from a matter of principle and conviction. Uh, these are things that I believe. It's just part of who I am. And my job as a leader is to kind of take those those core values and ideas um, and shape that into a public policy that's going to be able to to make my state the freest state in the country. And that's what we've done. But, you know, you, you talk about different issues. Um, we know going forward, one of the biggest issues is going to be which way the U.S. Supreme Court goes. I've had seven justices I've appointed in Florida. Uh, all seven have been rock rib conservative justices. I inherited a four to three liberal court and I turned it into a six one conservative court my first month in office. Uh, I know what it takes uh, to do a good job and to be a justice in the mold of Clarence Thomas and Sam Alito. But if you think about if a two term president starting at 24, you very well may have to uh, appoint replacements for Thomas Alito, which you and I know. They're as good as it gets. So if mm -hmm. you're missing, even if you do like a pretty good conservative, that's going to move the court to the left. So you've got mm -hmm. to make sure you're finding justices that are going to do as close as possible to filling those shoes. You may also be able to re replace people like Chief Justice Roberts and Sotomayor. Now, we all know you can take somebody that will be more conservative than Roberts and obviously Sotomayor. So it may very well be if you get eight years you can end up leaving a 7-2 conservative court with the majority that will last for a quarter of a century. When was that ever possible in any of our lifetimes? And so mm -hmm. a contrast to that, if the Democrats sweep in 24, what are they going to do? They're going to try to pack the U.S. Supreme Court. They're going to try to stack it with liberal justices to cancel out our modest conservative majority. So I would mm -hmm. say 16 was really important with the Scalia seat being open. But I'd say 24, this is a generational opportunity to solidify and expand a constitutionalist direction in our judiciary. You know, I'm starting to laugh, Governor, if people say, aren't you too young? How old are you, 44, 45? Something like that? 44. And uh, too young. Let me, let, me, let me get this straight. You served um, as a congressman. You're on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Before you were governor, you also served in the military when you were a young man. Tell us about that. And by the way, you're not too young to be a president of the United States. That's absurd. We've had younger. We had uh, Theodore Roosevelt. We had John Kennedy and so forth. But it's not a matter of younger. I mean, Biden's an old, old man. And that's okay. But, I mean, he's older than his years. You know, he's like 120 years old in reality. You're a vibrant young man. You've demonstrated you can be governor. But the point is, you do have some foreign policy knowledge, right? Sure. I think both as a congressman, but then also as a naval officer, I was deployed to uh, Fallujah, Iraq, Ramadi, those areas with Navy SEAL Team 1. Um, I was an advisor to the commander. I did do temporary duty in Guantanamo back during when that was a big deal. And so uh, I learned a lot in those experiences learned a lot from a national security perspective in Congress. I chaired the National Security uh, Subcommittee. 
thought deeply about those. I know I would be the first on active duty and has uh, served in war since 1988 when George H.W. Bush was elected. We haven't had one since then. I think that's important because one of the problems we see with our military has become politicized on DEI and pronouns and climate change and all these things mm. that are not part of the core mission. All is low. People are leaving the service. Recruiting is in the toilet. And on day one as commander in chief, all the politics, everybody is on the, the right page, mm. uh, restore mission. And you will see recruiting uh, go back up. And I'd also say just in terms of age, I mean, one, we need some energy in the executive. We certainly yeah. don't have that now. And I will go in on day one. Oh, you, I could tell your listeners what you'll get out of me one for eight years. We'll get somebody to be energy in the executive. And we are going to make sure we do everything we can. These problems say, what is the best possible experience going into something like, like president? I would say it's being an executive state especially during a major crisis and no governors in our lifetime had to deal with a crisis bigger than COVID to stand virtually alone in some of those decisions back against Tony Fauci back against the left fighting back against the media in school businesses and our individual rights and my state boomed as a result but I was out there on a ledge political career at risk when everyone said I was committed to Besides, yeah. because that's what leaders do. But up, I well, Gov- Governor, we're having better. a little technical problem on our end, so we have a lot of people trying to pour into. I'll just tell you this: um, you've also always been accessible, always been accessible. We appreciate that here, and we we look forward to talking you more down the road. And I think uh, this is a very exciting moment in our history. If you're a Republican. And uh, I think it's a very exciting day that you entered this race, sir. So we wish you all the best. DeSantis.com, Mark. I hope your folks will come in and pitch in and help us out. God bless. We will post it. We'll post it on our social sites. God bless you, sir. We'll be right back. Mark Lovin. I think what you're going to see, folks, and you're starting to see it, is all the also rands are going to try not to attack Trump, other than Sununu if he gets in, and Christie and Asa Hutchison. But the others who are more contender-like, they're going to focus on DeSantis. Some of these people are running for vice president, and I think uh, that would include Well, I won't say. But I think some of these people are running for vice president. Some of these people are earnestly running for president and hope if they don't make it, they'll be chosen for vice president. And some of them are earnestly running for president because they want to be president. I think that's DeSantis. It's obviously Trump. But I think the the wannabes in particular are going to be targeting DeSantis because they don't want anything to do with Trump in terms of targeting him. Because they know how brutal he'll be in his response, and they're not sure how brutal, or if brutal, DeSantis will be. This is just my opinion. I don't have any inside information. So you're going to see it. You've already seen it. Um, who is it? I can't remember her name. <laughs> anyway, one of the... What is the female's name who's in the race, Mr. Producer? What is it? Nikki Haley. I apologize. That's not intended to be rude in any way. And if any candidate running who's a relatively serious candidate, may I say, I can't bring every goofball on here, wants to come on the program, they're welcome to come on the program. RonDeSantis.com, that's the site. RonDeSantis.com, if you want to check it out, if you want to support him. And I will see you tomorrow. God bless you all. 